Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of Faster Cures, a center of the Milken Institute, Margaret Anderson. Hello, everybody. So I'm Margaret Anderson, and I head Faster Cures. Uh, you've probably heard a little bit about us. We're a center of the Milken Institute, and uh, we are located in Washington, DC. There are several other initiatives of the Milken Institute also located there, as well as other places in the globe. Um, so my little joke for today is that I'm from Washington, DC, and I'm here to help you. Um, so right now in biomedical research, we are living in an unprecedented era of scientific discovery. All of the incredible investment and the you know, staffing power, the human capital, the financial capital has culminated in this era that you're going to hear more about in this exciting panel um, where the science is just on fire. And we're finally seeing you know, solutions to problems that have been vexing us for decades. But you know, right now, we're also very conscious of the fact that we have so much more to do. So at Faster Cures, we talk from a statistical standpoint of the number of diseases that there are and then the number of treatments and cures that we actually have. So the number of diseases is 10,000 diseases that we currently know about. And, you know, as you've been hearing in some of the panels here at the Global Conference, there are new threats on the horizon. You know, there are also things that we need to prevent and public health issues that we need to, you know, sort of direct our attention to. But if you take that number of 10,000 diseases and then you think about the actual number of treatments and cures that have come through this kind of really difficult, exhaustive pipeline, we have about 500 of those. So at Faster Cures, we like to say we have an intense amount of work to do. So our mission is to work on the system. And it isn't as sexy as, you know, sort of, you know, some of the disease groups that focus in very specifically. But our job is to look at the system so that when you need it, it's actually working. Uh, and that's all that we do. We focus on public policy, based in Washington again, but globally as well. We focus on the issues around collaboration. How can we get the system and the components of the system really harmonized and really focused on the mission together? Uh, and then the, perhaps the most important thing that we do that we just hold very sacred is putting patients at the center. And there are some fantastically exciting developments where there's an emerging science of patient input to try to look at how do you put patients at the center of biomedical research so that we're actually discovering things that are highly relevant for them and personalized. So we want your ideas, we want your input, we want support, uh, we want to partner with you, and you know, my team has been here talking to many of you about that. We take away a lot of uh, the disruptive ideas that we've all been here hearing about uh, and bring that back into the biomedical research system. I think it's perhaps one of the most exciting things that the Milken Institute does, that we bring this convening together, uh, we listen to different ideas, and, and we kind of allow this space for creativity. Um, speaking of creativity and bringing you know, lots of different ideas together, um, our chairman, Mike Milken, who is going to be the master of ceremonies for this next panel, has been really looking forward into the future for decades. And he did this in spades in 2012. We're going to show you a quick video in a minute. He convened all of the leaders in science, in biomedical research, uh, in really looking to the future, and it was called the Celebration of Science. So what we're going to do is you're going to see a few of the highlights from that, and then after that, Mike Milken is going to come out and kind of blow your mind with some of the new areas of, of technology in biomedical research. So in closing, I want to thank all of you for um, caring about Faster Cures, for working with us, supporting us. Um, we are just, you know, as excited as we can be. We're kind of poised at the beginning. And um, I want all of you to feel that excitement because, the, as I said, the need is staggering and we have so much more work to do. And I, I want all of you to be part of that. So thank you very much. Here's the video on Celebration of Science. Thank you. 
Throughout history, diseases have devastated entire civilizations. In the 14th century, one third of the population of Europe, nearly 25 million people, died from the Black Plague. Smallpox killed an estimated 400 million people worldwide in the 20th century. And tens of millions of people throughout the world have died from cholera. As a result of these epidemics, worldwide life expectancy was grim. A baby born in 1800 could only expect to live an average of 26 years, and that number only rose to 31 years by 1900. The United States was not immune. One in five children born in America in 1900 died before the age of five. And the Spanish influenza of 1918 killed more than 600,000 Americans in a single year. But the combination of improved sanitation and the discovery of more than two dozen life-saving vaccines and the widespread use of antibiotics drastically reduced the rate of infectious diseases and resulted in a sharp drop in infant mortality. Other significant medical advances of the 20th century include the discovery of insulin to manage diabetes, the use of radiation and chemotherapy to treat cancer, the advent of the kidney dialysis machine, and the introduction of the cardiac pacemaker. By 1950, life expectancy jumped to 49 years, allowing people around the world to lead more productive lives. James Watson and Francis Crick's discovery of the chemical structure of DNA in 1953 eventually led to a greater understanding of Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, and many other debilitating diseases. Less than 40 years later, thousands of scientists from around the world joined forces on the groundbreaking Human Genome Project, financed by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, and the Wellcome Trust of London. This 13-year, $3.8 billion project has already started to revolutionize the way we diagnose, treat, and eventually prevent more than 4,000 genetic diseases that afflict people across the globe. The economic benefits have been equally astounding. The Human Genome Project created thousands of jobs and generated an economic impact far exceeding the original investment. Bioscience investments also hold the promise of helping solve the most significant global issues of the 21st century, including access to clean water, food production, defense against bioterrorism, energy supplies, and environmental sustainability. Investments in science have saved millions of lives and have had a profound effect on our quality of life. Worldwide life expectancy is now 67 years, while in America it's near 80, giving people everywhere the invaluable gift of more time with loved ones. We have witnessed remarkable achievements over the past century. But the potential for innovation is now greater than ever. The American people have made major investments that have brought us this far. We cannot afford to put the brakes on this engine of progress. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time to renew our commitment to bioscience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of the Milken Institute, Michael Milken. Thank you for joining us. For me, this is day seven. For many of you, it might only be day one. Uh, we have an amazing presentation today by five great scientists who are gonna tell us why we should be optimistic about the way we change, the way we are treated, prevention, wellness, and how research is gonna change. And when we think back about early medical strategies. Uh, we start to think about how we dealt with many of these issues before. Uh, lizard blood was obviously one of the most attractive ways to treat you. And you can't come to a Milken Institute event, at least one that I'm at, without really fully understanding this amazing achievement we've made in the past 115 years. Four million years of evolution increased average life expectancy by 11 years. Four million years, 11 years. And in the past 115 years, we've increased life expectancy by 40 
one years. And with the technology that we're going to learn about today and be able to deploy, there's no telling what the future brings. And it's not just an increase in life expectancy. It's an increase in the quality of life. The value of health is priceless. Saving one life saves the world. In economic terms, public health, medical research has been accountable for 50% or more of all economic growth. Southeast Asia, a doubling of life expectancy in two generations. Today, Sub-Saharan Africa, a doubling of life expectancy in one generation. It's an amazing achievement we've had and maybe the greatest achievement that man has ever done. As we step back and transition to the five presentations you're about to see, we keep in mind that advances in technology and cost, speed, storage, and access have made such a difference. And with 5G coming, in South Korea, they estimate you'll be able to download a movie in one second download a movie in one second. And when I think back, when I sat in those technology discussions with Warner and what's now Time Warner, 30 years ago, we always wondered, would someone watch a DVD if it was on four sides to hold the movie? You had to watch it, get up, turn it over, get up, take it out, put a new one in, and turn it over. Well, today in Korea, you can just watch it in one second. Probably not that good for the DVD business. 1976 for me was an exciting year. We wheeled the supercomputer onto our trading floor, the first one in the financial service industry. One million dollars per megabyte storage. Yes, and we had big sideburns in those days. Well, today, your little iPhone 6 Plus, instead of one million a megabyte, it's less than one cent. We're headed to a data storage cost one billionth, one billionth 40 years later. And today, if you want to communicate on this planet, you can reach almost everyone, whether they're in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Europe, the United States, and even Antarctica. When I first met Dr. Jonathan Simons in February of 1993, one of our country's most promising young scientist doctors, he had been at Princeton and Harvard and Mass General and Cambridge and was at Hopkins, and one talented researcher could read 500 letters of the human genome per day. Well, today the world has changed. And today we have a situation where a $5,000 machine can read millions and process millions of times what Dr. Simon was capable of doing in 1993. He is free to analyze the data, not keep track of that data. And so we're going to get a look at the future here from five outstanding individuals. But before we do, of course, we have to have a quiz. You can't come to any Milken event without a quiz. But to get you into the future, we have special instructions uh, that you can use your mobile devices, part of the seven billion. And can we uh, see those instructions? There we go. So you can text to Global 2016, uh, and you can answer the questions. And it's not complicated because it's multiple choice, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, have you got that down? Now, here's your question. The first sequencing 
uh, of the human genome in 1993 took 13 years and Francis Collins, who's been with us for the last eight or so years, was put in charge of that project. And if you consider all the research at the very beginning that was required and accelerated greatly at the end, what, uh, and it cost about over $3 billion. So here's the question. How long did it take for Flick? And let's take a look at Flick again, who he is, so you know who he is. He's this young PhD candidate who linked 1,024 processors how long did it take him to sequence a full human genome? Now, the New York Times had predicted in the late 90s that at the rate we were going, we would not be completed to the 22nd century. So let's see how our answers are coming in here. There come the E's. They've got a slow start, those E's. Okay, well, we're going to go with this as an approximation. It looks like the number one answer is four and a half minutes. Quite a change from 13 years. We did have a few at 76 hours. Uh, the correct answer is Flix sequenced the human genome in 7.3 seconds. So as we can just imagine what technology has allowed us to do, I would like to now introduce you to by this, can we put the picture up of our five uh, panelists maybe, the slide? Uh, and we're gonna start with Jack Gilbert from the University of Chicago. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jack Gilbert, and you're covered in bacteria. Microbiologist Jack Gilbert studies how microbial communities assemble themselves in natural and man-made environments. Gilbert's goal is to characterize all of the microbes on the planet. His team has already identified more than 22 million species from samples submitted by hundreds of people around the world. So you have 100 trillion bacterial cells inside your body. And what we're starting to understand is by looking at those organisms, we can say intricate things about your health and your well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jack Gilbert. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, my name is Jack Gilbert. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Chicago. And what I want to talk to you today about is a revolution in ecology, which sounds a little bit unusual for a medical session, but uh, I am an ecologist. I'm an ecologist that's been hired into a medical department to help to revolutionize medicine. If I was to tell you how we currently understand disease and the human genome, you might understand that, that principle. We've heard about the, the rush of detail in trying to understand the human genome, link it to disease, and find out those individual genes which are responsible for the disease. I myself have an APOE mutation, which leads me open to having a, a heightened susceptibility to developing Alzheimer's. My mother has twice the risk due to a double mutation. And does this mean I'm going to get Alzheimer's? I know I have an increased risk, but what are the factors that would lead to its onset? Well, it's important to understand, you're not just a human genome. You're a microbial genome as well. In fact, you are 100 trillion microbial genomes. Around three pounds of your body mass is bacteria, viruses, fungi. And they collectively have 100 times the amount of genetic information that your own genome does. And they are with you from birth. They are given to you by your mother um, in the initial phases. You're born mostly sterile. You get your bacteria from your mother during birth, and then f even from her breast milk and her physical interaction, and then from your family, and then from that dog that licked you on the face that time, and then from the mud you played in and made those lovely little powder cakes that you showed to your mum and she didn't like those. I got that. Um, 
So we, we had a, a fundamental interaction with the environment. Right now even, each one of you is releasing 36 million bacterial cells into your immediate vicinity every hour. So you're all becoming more microbiologically similar. Okay? And those bacteria are colonizing you like an island. And fundamentally, you need them for your health. Okay? You need them in your body, you need them to be there. But over the last hundred years, we've been doing something rather negative. We've been eradicating that exposure to the microbial world, which our species, over the last five million years of our evolution, has become dependent on. We've been eroding, almost deforesting, our own microbiome through the indiscriminate use of antibiotics, through cleaning products which help us to protect ourselves from the 99.9% .9 of bacteria which are going to kill us instantly. It's not true. Um, that, that removal of us from our environment has been a fundamental problem in the development of our health. We think this has led to asthma, allergies being significantly increased, and many other conditions. In fact, through what I call microbiome-wide association studies, this is akin to a genome-wide association study we heard about earlier, where we would link a gene in the human genome to a disease. Here we're linking microbial ecology, so num hundreds of different species of bacteria to disease. We found hundreds of different conditions which have been linked to changes in the microbiome or have been linked to being onset or delivered by changes in the microbiome. So a couple of examples of this, researchers at University of Chicago and across the country have uncovered fantastic new therapies for treating cancer, immunotherapies, which we heard about across this conference. And yet, what we found is that there are still people that do not respond particularly well to the immunotherapy. In, in cutting-edge research, we found that by adding certain bacteria back into the experience, into the body of these people, we can significantly accelerate the success rate of that immunotherapy. This is fundamental. We're adding a probiotic. Not any old probiotic, a very specific probiotic, but a probiotic back into the experience of these people, which is improving the efficacy of their medical treatment. We know that neurocognitive disorders, in my own work on depression and anxiety and, and even autism, and even neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, have actually been linked to changes in the microbiome. In our animal studies, we've shown that by adding certain bacteria back into a mouse that's predisposed to Alzheimer's, we can prevent the mouse from developing it. Imagine if we could transcend that therapy very rapidly through improving our connectivity across scientific disciplines to enable us to take those findings in the lab and put them into the clinic as quickly as possible. We're nearly there. We need to push ourselves harder to transcend that boundary. And then we wouldn't just be able to treat Alzheimer's with these uh, microbial therapies, we'd be able to treat other conditions. Imagine treating depression. Imagine really being able to attack this, this problem, which uh, has massive consequences for our society, let alone societies across the world. Depression is a, a major problem in our world. And if we could treat it, we could have a real impact upon humanity. Surgical infections in our own work. I'm a, an ecologist, actually a marine ecologist, if you would believe it, working in a surgery department. And it's my job to try and find out ways in which my understanding of microbial ecology in the ocean can be transcended into a surgical theater to determine ways to treat the microbiome as well as treating the patient. Imagine how traumatic a surgery is to the body of the human being that's, being, that's undergoing the surgery, okay? And then imagine how traumatic it is to the bacteria in there. We normally don't care about them, right? We try and kill them off because they could be dangerous. What we found in our study is that by, by eradicating that mentality and feeding the microbiome during surgery, the bacteria, the 100 trillion bacteria inside your intestine, we can actually prevent them from going rogue, from attacking the host. We give them a, a, a novel therapy which we develop with material scientists and computer scientists who helped us to model that dynamic. And when we add this in, the bacteria are satiated and they no longer, when stressed, attack the host. This is transformative. We believe we can eradicate 90% of surgical infections by using this kind of technology and are trying to implement that right now. So, moving on to a, a an understanding of how to attack this in humanity, I want to propose a concept we call microbial GPS. 
I want to be able to give each of you a GPS to your microbial health, because not all of you can change your genome, but you can certainly change your microbiome, and you do it on a regular basis. The food you're eating right now is changing your microbiome. Imagine if I could tell you exactly what you needed to do to get your microbiome back to optimal health. What kind of probiotics you might be able to take, what kind of diet you might be able to use, what kind of lifestyle you should adopt. Maybe I should tell you to go and get a dog or rescue a dog. Maybe, maybe you need to take a particular antibiotic to treat it. And then eradicating that's going to have massive implications. So we are proposing microbial GPS as a way of transcending our ability to take control of our health and our life. The University of Chicago uh, is a research university. Argonne National Laboratory, part of the Department of Energy's National Lab Network, and the Marine Biological Laboratory, a marine institute, we're taking research from agricultural microbiology, attempts to improve productivity, disease resistance, and tolerance in plants, from the marine sector, and from climate activity research, trying to figure out ways of taking that data, transcending our boundaries as researchers, and applying it to the next generation of microbial research. So I think this is an incredibly exciting time because we are moving across those boundaries and presenting the future of healthcare from an ecologist's perspective. Thank you. Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn received the Nobel Prize for discovering telomerase, an enzyme that plays a key role in cell function, cell aging, and most cancers. Telomerase produces tiny units of DNA that seal off the ends of chromosomes. These DNA units, called telomeres, protect the integrity of the genes and maintain chromosomal stability and accurate cell division. Preventing cancer sounds somewhat passive. Intercepting it, I think, captures the active way in which the science is, is taking us to uh, new ways that we can combat cancer. You intercept it before the damage is done, before the full-blown, clinically recognizable, advanced tumor is discovered in the clinic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Blackburn. Thank you. What is the dream of the future of medicine? We want to prevent diseases, pre preempt, intercept them. We can think of ourselves as we go through life in a health span where we're in a state of pre disease and then we go through the years and we come to advanced diseases. We have incredible ways we can treat diseases. But when they're advanced, it's as though the firemen were brought to rescue the house. They do heroic jobs, but sometimes the house is damaged. What's happened in the last few years is with the advent of basic research, clinical research, and technological advances in understanding large amounts of data from human biology, we can go further and further back into the stages in which diseases unfold over the years, and now we can dream of of preempting the disease, leaving, leaving the house intact. That's where biology is taking us. That's where clinical medicine is taking us. This is where technologies are taking us. So I'm going to give you a small part of that story because it's my own personal story and it's led me into how I think that this is a truly achievable dream in our lives. And that is the world of the telomeres. Now, I, s I explored into this world as though I were an astronomer exploring deep into the galaxy, excepting I was exploring deep into the genetic heart of the cell, the chromosomes carrying all the genetic information and the telomeres that capped them off. And we knew that telomeres wear down over time. So I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of what that's like. Now, uh, I brought a very handy analog here. This may remind you, this is a chromosome. It's a large shoelace. Some of you don't have shoelaces. I don't have any, so I had to bring my own. So we have telomeres at the end. They protect like the ca caps at the ends of chromosomes. And when the telomeres wear down, this cap comes off. It frays, and the end gets frayed. This is not a functional shoelace anymore. So we have to keep these ends healthy. And we have to counteract what happens in 
in most of our normal cells, which is the telomeres grind down. So years ago, I and my graduate student, Carol Greider, here we are in the 1980s, here's Carol with her Mickey Mouse ears on, we're adventurous Californians, and we said, we're going to find something that makes telomeres longer, and we did. And uh, what we had to find out was how that plays out in humans' lives. So this takes many, many years to play out, but gradually, over years, the balance of the adding that you saw is uh, counteracted by, sadly, the shortening, and eventually cells will stop dividing, and that leads to real problems in cells. The shoelace end gets frayed. This leads the cells to senesce, and all sorts of appalling things happen to cells. I won't list them all, but their energy powerhouses go bad. They can't work properly. They can't respond to signals if they're a pancreatic cell. And worse, they become like rotten apples in a barrel. These cells start leaking pro-inflammatory substance out, and these have been related to many of those major diseases of, of aging that we want to preempt. The major ones, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, uh, heart, uh, sorry, cardiovascular <laughs> cancers, um, the dementias like Alzheimer's, all of these things creep up on us over the years, and each one of these has been related to the inability of telomeres to be maintaining the health of cells. Of course, it's related to many other factors as well, but this is one that we've learned about, and we really understand from the power of genetics and genomics and molecular biology and clinical studies, we understand that this is playing one of the causal roles. This, this is huge because it gives us some real understanding and it gives us thoughts, what can we do about this? So we can turn it into big data. For example, we built a robot and measured telomeres in 100,000 people, and sure enough, they wear down, and we measure them, and we want to say, what's happening before they've got too short? Can we anticipate things? So we looked in people, and sure enough, telomeres run down with age, but they actually run down very variably, and how fast they run down really predicts mortality quite significantly. Mortality from cardiovascular disease and from cancers. And these are numbers. So, for example, if you're in the bottom um, 10 percentile, you're twice as likely to die as if you're in the top percentile of telomere length just within three years. So it's a big predictor, uh, but it's very statistical. So now I want to get to the point of pre precision medicine and the big data technological advances that that can do to augment something as simple-minded but profound as, as this. Because what one wants to do is to turn biological measures and clinical information into precision medicine. Now, what is precision medicine? It sounds very grand, and in fact, it can involve huge amounts of data, and one should pull that in whenever possible. But there's a wonderful example of how we can use an example of this to uh, illustrate the principles of precision medicine. It always sounds a little bit overwhelming when we talk about these vast amounts of data. But the principle is very simple, and that is, you simply, instead of looking at certain factors one at a time, I was just telling you about one factor, telomere length. You look at different ones together, and you make combinations, and that enormously increases the power of your predictions. And so I want to give you a very real-life example on the ground to illustrate this principle. Here we are in Houston, Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. 441 patients are there, and those 441 patients uh, have come in with bladder cancer. How long are they going to live? Well, it turns out that by combining two key pieces of information at bladder cancer's diagnosis, telomere length, and, of all things, depression, one could make predictions. So let's look at these 441 patients, and we're going to just divide them up into the ones who were depressed or who had shorter telomeres in their immune cells, which are very important for controlling cancers, or had neither. They had long telomeres and they had no depression. So if they only had those one at a time or neither, after two and a half years, this fraction of those people had died. But if you had both, after only two and a half years, that fraction of people had died. Now we go out to five years. Of course, more people had died uh, five years later. If they, 
had neither short telomeres nor depression, or one, only one of those. But if they had both, they all had died. That is the principle of precision medicine. It tells us things by combining sources of information. And this is a very simple one. This is the power of precision medicine. So what can we do to maintain our telomeres in a healthy way? Telomeres are... Um, a, something that we have to think about, because they're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in terms of telomerase. Telomerase is both good in the context of healthy cells, but unfortunately, it fuels cancer cells to keep on multiplying. So we can't play with this fire at this point pharmacologically, but I'll end with the good news. Luckily, there are a lot of things we can do which are influencing telomere maintenance. We balance our telomere length in lots of ways that have been very, very well studied studies, and weighting down telomeres, making them shorter, or a lot of factors, I've listed them here, and making telomeres better are a lot of other factors. And you can look at all of these, and you can see some are in or out of our control, and the point is that what we are learning from just this one piece of information, and imagine what we can do when we combine it, as I showed you with the other pieces of information that come from rich data sets, I think we can have the option of making disease optional. Thank you. Dr. Vadim Bachman's laboratory at Northwestern University has pioneered the development of new technologies in biophotonics and biomedical optics, utilizing light to understand the structure and function of cells and tissues at the nanoscale. These innovations have led to new methods for detecting, screening, and diagnosing cancer, potentially making it possible to eradicate the disease before the patient begins to display symptoms. I want to prolong patient life by 10 years, by 20 years. I don't want anybody to die from cancer at all. How can we actually do that? And the answer is really not in developing better drugs. The answer is in early detection and prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vadim Bachman. When it comes to cancer, by far the best way to save lives is early detection. We know that. But we do too little cancer screening with imperfect tests. What we need is smart screening, something that can be used in a primary care setting low cost and sensitive to disease that can be cured. We have a great example of that. It's called the pap smear. 60 years ago, cervical cancer used to be number one cancer in women in this country. Today, cervical cancer mortality is down by more than 90%. And it's not because we have learned how to treat it better. It's because we have learned how to detect it early enough using what is called personalized two-tier screening. Cervical cancer used to be detected using colposcopy, which was too complex to be carried out on every woman. Pap smear, a much simpler test, changed that. All of a sudden, it became possible to screen everybody and identify a small subset of patients who needed colposcopy for definitive diagnosis. In fact, in almost every country, as soon as pap smear was introduced, cervical cancer mortality went down dramatically. So why is that we were able to make such a big difference in cervical cancer survival, but not in the other major cancers? And the answer is because we don't have two-tier screening for other major malignancies. Actually, we do have existing tests that can be used as the second-tier screening for most cancers. Take colon cancer as an example. Colonoscopy does prevent it quite effectively by finding and removing precancerous polyps. But we can't use colonoscopy on everybody. Well, we don't have enough gastroenterologists, it's too expensive, and well, let's face it, we don't really like it, right? <laughs> As the result, most of us don't get colonoscopies, and colon cancer is the second major cause of deaths in the country. What we need is the first tier screening test, something simple, which can identify a subset of patients harboring precancerous polyps 
and identify patients who need colonoscopy. In order to develop such a test, my lab asked the question, a fundamental question, how cancer actually starts. And it usually doesn't start from a single rogue cell. Let's go back to the colon cancer as an example. It results because of the interplay between environmental exposures, such as diet, toxins, microbiome, and genetic and epigenetic status of the patient. As the result, many cells in the colon and the rectum keep accumulating genetic and epigenetic alterations. This is called field carcinogenesis. By statistical bad luck, some of the cells lead to a clone that forms a tumor. In case of lung cancer, field carcinogenesis extends all the way to the mucosa of the cheek. See, most existing diagnostic tests look for byproducts of a tumor, such as proteins in the blood. And these tests work fairly well, some of them at least, detecting large late-stage cancers. They don't work so well detecting early and especially precancerous lesions. Size does matter. And this makes a world of difference for a patient. Survival rate for stage four colon cancer is only 11%, but if you can detect it early at a stage of precancerous polyp, it's almost always preventable. And that's why detection of field carcinogenesis is so powerful. It's not about the size, size doesn't matter. It's about the true risk of harboring cancer. Right? One of the first things that happens in field carcinogenesis is chromatin in the cell nucleus undergoes a transformation. Chromatin is a three-dimensional structure that regulates gene expression. If genes are hardware, chromatin is undoubtedly software. In almost all cancers, chromatin changes, allowing cells to explore a greater genomic landscape to vary their genes. All of a sudden, cells can change and evolve. Some of them, by statistical bad luck, learn how to proliferate uncontrollably, how to metastasize, how to evade, avoid the immune system, how to survive chemotherapies. Essentially, this is what makes cancer cancer. The chromatin alterations happen at the nanoscale, something conventional microscopy can see. It's two orders of magnitude below the resolution of conventional microscope. So in order to detect these alterations, we had to develop a new technology, which we called nanocytology. It's a combination of microscopy and spectroscopy of light scattered from each and every resolution voxel within the cell. For the first time, we were able to sense nanoscale alterations in the chromatin. At this point, we were ready to combine the biology of field carcinogenesis in nanoscale imaging technology to come up with a cancer screening test. In order to detect early stage lung cancers, we brush cells from the cheek, deposit cells on a glass slide, and use nanocytology to detect nanoscale changes in the chromatin. This test is so simple, it can be carried out in any physician's office, even at Walgreens, if you will. If the test is positive, the patient would get a second-tier test, a CT scan. Nanocytology has about 90% sensitivity to early stage, almost always curable lung cancers. For colon cancer, we brush cells from the rectum, easy to do as well and are able to predict whether the patient has precancerous polyps anywhere in the colon. And if the answer is yes, a patient would go get a colonoscopy. A test as simple as a brushing of the cervical cells, which can be done concurrently with a routine pap smear, can identify early ovarian cancers. 
In fact, nanocytology has been shown to work in each and every type of cancer we have studied. In addition to lung, colon, and ovarian, the list includes prostate, pancreatic, esophageal, liver, and thyroid cancers. This is no longer science fiction. As early as 2017, we have a really good shot at introducing the first lung cancer screening test in clinical practice, shortly followed by a colon cancer test, shortly followed by an ovarian cancer test, and the list can go on. Essentially, this is nanotechnology pop smear for many, many cancers. Pop smear reduced cervical cancer screening by more than 90%. Imagine if nanocytology can do the same thing for many other major cancers. You know, it would be too presumptive of me to say that this is the beginning of the end in our war on cancer, but I will say, paraphrasing Winston Churchill, that it's the end of the beginning. Thank you. Nina Tanden is CEO and co-founder of EpiBone, the world's first company growing living human bones for skeletal reconstruction. This technology results in shorter recovery times without the complications of foreign body implantation to the more than 900,000 patients who undergo bone-related surgeries each year. The gold standard when you need a bone implant is quite literally to cut it out of a human. What we propose to do is something really different. We're making bones from stem cells and saying, how do we collaborate with those stem cells that are repairing our bodies every day? I feel like we're getting away with something really amazing. It's, um, it's a real privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nina Tanden. Hi. It's a huge honor to be here. I'm so nervous, so just <laughs> putting that out there. All right. <laughs> this isn't about me. Let's deflect for a moment and meet Noah. May I have the first slide, please? When he was 10 years old, he fell out of a tree in Central Park during recess and broke his ankle, his left ankle. And he happened to have broken it in the growth plate, which what, what this meant was over the ensuing next 20 years and, and multiple surgeries, um, they were constantly struggling to try and keep his left leg as long as his right leg. Okay, And this, the only surgery picture you'll look at <laughs> after a recovery Surgeons were finally able to put him back together. Um, he happens to be my fiance. I met him surfing in Costa Rica. Uh, <laughs> he 3D printed the engagement ring. He knows his audience. Um, but the reason why I show this picture is that it's a really good example of you know, ankle flexion, right? Surfing. And um, what was the magic ingredient to put his ankle back together, right? You might be guessing by now, just having seen that movie, it was a piece of his hip bone. Okay, so they he calls it his shark bite. They took a piece of his hip bone out, put it in his ankle, and he's okay. All right, this is, this is how many bone surgeries are performed. But what he'll also tell you is that his abdomen hurt, lo hurt more than his ankle. Okay, because as we know, there's really no piece of bone that we don't need. All right, and so for, for millions of procedures worldwide, this is, this is really the gold standard. If we need a piece of human bone, we cut it out of a human. And I love the history lesson that we just got now because we truly are witnessing a revolution in how we repair the body. You know, throughout history, when we, when we were broken, we really just let ourselves be the way we were. Um, that's why I love Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, this idea of the body as perfect as it is, it will right itself if left to its own devices. But somewhere around the turn of the last century, while we were developing things like interchangeable parts on the assembly line, we started to view our bodies in a similar way, right? Like machines. And if you needed a new heart, you might get one from a donor, or you might get um, a mechanical one, right? But the idea was still the same. If we are machines, if we're going to repair the body, we should be like mechanics. 
But what I love now, okay, is that we're starting to view our bodies much more like ecosystems. As we learned earlier, we are 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in our own bodies, right? It's not only we have so many genomes living inside of us, and I think we're starting to really view the possibilities of what open up when we view our bodies like living ecosystems. Okay? And if we're viewing our bodies like living ecosystems, maybe the best strategy of repair is for us to become gardeners. And I think this is a really powerful moment for us. So this is, this is what we do at EpiBone. This is our team. Um, my co-founder and I did our PhD with this amazing woman, Gordana vonjak Novakovic. We've assembled a team around this idea that we had developed as academics in the lab for, you know, 20 years. Um, <laughs> and what we do is we, we follow this approach. I like to say we're where um, 3D fabrication meets regenerative medicine, because what we do is we engineer living, personalized bone grafts, okay, that are correct in terms of their puzzle piece shape, but also correct in terms of their, you know, being, out, being your own selves. There's no risk of rejection, right? So, you know, after blood, bone is the most transplanted human tissue, okay? And for millions of procedures worldwide, um, this is just, it's just not enough, okay? If we're getting injured, at age 15, okay, and ACL tears have gone up 400% in the past 10 years for people under the age of 18, okay. We're getting injured at 15, and we're hopefully gonna live until 115. Titanium implants that need to be replaced every 10 years aren't gonna cut it, right? And we can't cut ourselves apart and repurpose our own bones the way um, we're doing now. So we take two things from the patient. We take a three-dimensional um, image, AKA a CT scan. We take, um, to make the perfect puzzle piece shape, we take cells from the patient from their adipose tissue, that's the polite way of saying fat, and we <laughs> put those stem cells into that um, perfect shape in a bioreactor which cultivates the tissue over time. It takes about three weeks to grow a piece of living bone. So here's a short video explaining the process. There's the, the cells growing up, machining the scaffold. Growing up the cells, those are my pink gloves. <laughs> And after three weeks, we have a piece of living bone that's ready for implantation, okay? Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we're academics, we're nerds, we've been working on this a long time, and we've now spun out the company to continue translating that work towards the clinic. And we hope that this perfect fit from a physical perspective as well as an immunological perspective will really mean better integration over time. So I have to show you some science pictures. Over three and six months of implantation, we're currently in pigs. Um, we've seen beautiful um, connection of the graft to the host tissue. We've also seen beautiful evidence of vascular ingrowth deep within the tissue. These cells do a lot more. We need cells, we're alive. It's not just a piece of coral. Um, and we were 10 months into a one-year pig study, which is really exciting as well. That's my co-founder going through TSA with some bones in the suitcase. <laughs> and uh, I love that we heard about what um, pig teeth in our first opening session, right? Or, um, and after, so you'll see some pig teeth right here. This is a pig skull after zero, three, four, six, and nine months, we see beautiful integration of the host and um, an epi bone. Okay, we're targeting craniofacial bones as our first beachhead market because there's high need. Um, everybody's face is different, and um, there are certain orphan designations that we're looking for um, approval for. Um, but what I think is really exciting when we think about um, what can happen if we start attaching cartilage to those bones, we start attaching ligaments to those bones, and we think about those game-changing markets in, in, in joint trauma, arth arthritis, dental, and so on. Um, so this is... Um, a very exciting story for us. We've been getting a lot of really good support from um, folks around the world that have been helping us um, with, with our journey. We actually have a couple of our beloved angels in the audience right now. I won't put them on the spot, but we've gotten a lot of really good support as we um, transition this technology out of the lab, you know? Because it's one thing to have a science technology, and it's another thing to have a science-based business. And as we make that journey, it's, I think, really important for us to um, to gather all the right people together. Um, awesome, this, just selected tech pioneers that so will be going to Davos, which is really exciting. Um, but I would just like to close by saying, you know, as exciting as this story is for us, I love to think about what is the bigger story here, okay? What is the movie that I wanna be an extra in? And I think for me, the idea that 
if in the past we looked above for the answers, you know, because we didn't really have the tools to really repair ourselves. And then we've gotten so far in the past 115 years with extending our lives and creating new therapies. Isn't it exciting to think that if we start to make friends and collaborate with those cells that repair our bodies every day, that we can think that the next generation of technologies can be so high-tech that they're natural, okay? That we can look within ourselves, within our own bodies, as the source of our own healing. And I'm really honored to be a part of that story, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Best-selling author, businessman, and academic, Juan Enriquez examines the intersection of science, business, and society to learn where our species may be headed next. What I think we are doing is we're transitioning as a species into a Homo evolutus that, for better or worse, is not just a hominid that's conscious of his or her environment, it's a hominid that's beginning to directly and deliberately control the evolution of its own species, of bacteria, of plants, of animals, and I think that's such an order of magnitude change that your grandkids or your great-grandkids may be a species very different from you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Juan Enriquez. All right, so I know at the end of these talks, you're all thinking, boy, there's nothing like good gene research to just rev up the afternoon. <laughs> But as you're thinking of that, if we could go to the first slide, um, I want to talk to you about the implications of this stuff. And because we're in LA, I'm going to start with a very young Dustin Hoffman. And in this iconic movie, The Graduate, there's two key scenes. There's the seduction scene. I'm not going to talk about that. And then there's a scene where the old guy takes the recent graduate out by the swimming pool, puts his arm around him, and says, just one word. And you all know what that word is, it's plastics, and unfortunately, it was completely wrong. <laughs> Let me explain why it was wrong. So, the word should have been silicon. And the reason the word should have been silicon is because the basic patents that did the, the digital revolution had already been filed. The year this movie's released, Fairchild is already selling semiconductors. The year after this movie's released, Intel's founded. So, had this graduate actually heard the right one word, maybe he would have ended up on stage with these two characters. <laughs> and the end of this sad story is, instead, he ended up selling Tupperware. <laughs> so, in 2015, you've got a bunch of kids ready to graduate. What's the one word? You take a kid out by the pool and you say just one word. My argument is you should say life code. And the reason you should say life code is because even though we've been modifying living things for a long time, we've been taking mustard weed and suppressing the flowers to get broccoli, we've been making bigger leaves in kale, we've sterilized flowers to get cauliflower, which you should think about next time you go to an organic market <laughs> and eat all natural food. But what we're doing today is very different because we're inserting genes and we actually know what we're doing. We're not trying to figure out what happens. We're saying, if you put this gene here, this might happen. And to pick a politically neutral term, this is intelligent design. And as we practice intelligent design, one of the consequences of this life code stuff is that we're curing a whole bunch of deadly diseases. And as we heard, in a normal, natural world, it is normal and natural to have plagues that wipe out 10 or 20% of humanity. It is unnatural for us not to die of deadly diseases. A world with polio is a natural world. A world without polio or without smallpox is an unnatural world. So this unnatural world hasn't been awful to us. We've doubled our lifespan, we're feeding 7 billion people, and we're creating whole new life forms like the flowers you have in front of you. Those are not wildflowers. Those are very deliberately engineered to look, smell, last as we want them to. If you really want an all-natural world, go watch this television show, Naked and Afraid. <laughs> right? They take all your clothes, they take your you know, DEET, they take your food, they take your matches, they take everything. You end up 
all natural. And then they follow them for 30 days, and it ain't pretty what happens to human beings in an all-natural world. So what's the bottom line on this stuff? What's the consequence of this stuff? Well, basically, we've taken Darwin and Wallace, who came up with natural selection, random mutation, as the force that guided what lives and dies for four billion years, and we flipped Darwin on his head. Because what we're practicing today is unnatural selection and non-random mutation. So let me unpack that for a minute. This is natural selection. This is unnatural selection. <laughs> when you take a little chihuahua that you see on Rodeo Drive in an Hermes bag, and you put it on the African plain, that's natural selection. <laughs> a cornfield is the ne least natural place on Earth. You will never walk through a savanna, a forest, a jungle, and see one plant growing at the same time in orderly rows for our purposes and nothing else living there. And by the way, half the surface of the Earth is on natural selection because we want our cities here, we want our suburb here, we want our garden here, we don't like these animals, we like these animals a lot, and these animals are cute. So we're picking what lives and dies on at least half the surface of the planet. And then to make things more interesting, this whole random mutation bit, life is a casino, not anymore. We're very deliberately inserting genes using instruments like CRISPR into cells for very specific purposes. And by the way, eight of the top 10 best-selling medicines are grown in living things, including Humira. And that is a complete example of an unnatural mutation for our purposes. So what are we doing about this? So like all good stories, it starts in a bar in Virginia about a decade ago. And after three scotches, Craig Venter, Ham Smith, Dave Kiernan, and I began to wonder, can you program cells in the same way as you program computer chips? Your computer chip really doesn't care in your phone if you're running pictures or films or movies or love letters or contracts or whatever, as long as it's in ones and zeros. What would happen if we could program a cell in the same way and a few years later, on a mere 40 million bucks, we were able to take this picture. And I know that really excites you. <laughs> it did me too. But that's the world's first synthetic life form, that's the world's first programmable cell, and basically what it means is we can make green goo. And the really neat thing about green goo, this software makes its own hardware. And that's a big deal because that green goo becomes this. And then when you go into our greenhouses in La Jolla, it becomes this. And then when you put it into tubes, it becomes this. And then it becomes that. And if you take it into the Imperial Valley, it becomes that. And at what point, you might say, and what in the hell are you growing in that green goo? <laughs> and the answer is, what would you like us to grow? Because these are programmable cells. So one of the things we did is we found a nifty little startup in Texas called ExxonMobil. <laughs> and they said, we'd like you to program this to make fuels. And then we found another startup called BP, and they said, we'd like you to substitute part of the refineries. And then we found Novartis, and they said, we want you to make a year's worth of flu vaccines in a week. We found ADM, and they said, you want you make foods. We found a different company we haven't announced yet, to make proteins for humans. You can store all data humans have ever generated, every picture, every book, every film, in one teaspoon of DNA. This stuff is going to change the world, and it's going to change the world in an absolutely fundamental way. And it's already beginning to change it, because this is not stuff going on at PhD-level labs at a few universities. You can buy your own kit and take it home to your kids for 500 bucks. And as of a month and a half ago, there's a programming language that you can put into E. coli. So as you're thinking of these structures, when somebody takes a recent graduate out to a pool and says life code, it's probably a very good idea to pay some attention. Because nothing in the world is going to change humanity and all life on this planet more than the ability to read and write life code. Thank you very much. So you've had a brief look at the future. 
from five different approaches at this time. And if you had a chance to read Juan's book, As the Future Catches You, you see a situation where we started thinking about that ways of communicating through hydroglyphics or 10,000 Chinese characters and the advantage we had with the 26 letter alphabet to deal with to pass information from one generation to another. And as Juan wrote, the key in the latter part of the 20th century was to understand the zeros and the one, and the key in the 21st century is to understand DNA and what it's capable of doing. But now that you've learned all this, it's time for your next quiz. Now the last one, uh, didn't count this one. We're keeping track of your score, uh, and we'll see how you do during the presidential debates at the end of the day. So here's your question, just to remind you. Global 2016, 22333, and all you have to enter is A, B, or C. So which of these medical breakthroughs came from 13th century Venice. A, eyeglasses, B, band-aids, C, aspirin, D, citrus fruit, or E, stethoscopes. Let's see how this changed. Right now, band-aids are doing very poorly. So we're going to just give you another second here. B has arrived on the scene. Okay. So far it looks like your number one pick is eyeglasses, then stethoscopes, then citrus fruits to prevent scurvy then aspirin, and lastly, Band-Aids. Well, let's start with aspirin. Aspirin, C. Well, let's see. How did that one do? Think Germany, 1897. Germany, 1897. Let's look at aspirin. So that one's not going to work. It didn't happen from Venice. What about stethoscopes, our number two pick in the audience? Think France, 1916, 1816. Uh, let's go to the one next, citrus, or the Band-Aids. Okay, we'll look at the lowest one, Band-Aids. Well, this is the United States contribution, Band-Aids, 1920. Scurvy, a little early for Venice, Scotland in the 18th century. And so, yes, you win the prize, which allows you to go to the presidential debate later today. And eyeglasses, Venice from the 1300s. So I'd like to just bring out for your uh, last minute applause all of our panelists and once again, you can find them online. Yes, they would welcome your support financially in their programs to change the world. So if you could come out and join us again. Jack Gilbert. Well, we thank you. We look forward to the upcoming panels, and Mike Clouton is going to tell you what you can do, but don't forget these talks. They'll all be online, and if you're interested in supporting their work, we'll find a way for you to communicate with them directly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, panelists. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm a trustee of the University of Chicago, so I get some advice there. Listen to this man. <laughs>
All right, we have been talking about the future of humanity. This is a wonderful way to have a, a capper on that, but we're not through yet. We've got several more sessions this afternoon, culminating, as I said, with the new entrance into the presidential race. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy the afternoon. See you later.